for those of you who may not know, Workhorse, relatively small company. Uh, we make, we focus on helping people deliver things. Uh, we make electric trucks and hybrid trucks, and we also make delivery drones. That we're just starting to, uh, to get into, and we combine the two. And we'll talk about that here in a, in a second. But primarily, we work with last mile, right? So last mile, um, de delivery of goods, usually by fairly good-sized vehicles. Um, as we've heard from a couple speakers, those, those vehicles tend to uh, cause quite a bit of pollution. So it's kind of low-hanging fruit. If we can um, lower the, the, the emissions and the cost of those vehicles, uh, you know, it, it floats a lot of boats. So, um, but before we go forward, I think uh, we got to go backwards a little bit. Uh, this is the Pony Express, right? This is how it kind of all started, as far as I can tell. Uh, this is how things were delivered. And although it looks pretty archaic, you know, in some senses, we haven't strayed too far from this, right? Two major components of that picture, a horse and a driver, right? Um, so for, and we, we try to work with both. We try to help both sides of that equation. Uh, so let's talk about the horse first. Right? So these are some modern day horses, right? Probably look familiar to you. Um, they haven't really changed too much. You know, been, in the last few years, and especially what we heard from like UPS, some pioneering efforts have been going on. But I think it's fair to say, if you looked at these 50 years ago, they weren't all that different, right? Um, and it, it's be, because of several things, but you need a certain amount of cubic feet, and you need a, a person driving them. But there's kind of a problem uh, with the conventional vehicle. Uh, I got this from the EPA. They didn't have a version for a truck, but it's very similar for a truck. It's actually worse for a truck. You know, after, I think the Model T came out 108 years ago. And after 108 years of refinement, uh, by countless, think of the engineering hours that have gone into the refinement of internal combustion engines and their propulsion. So, in, in kind of city driving a car, uh, in the end, the end result is about 14% of the energy gets to the wheels. Again, that's after 108 years of refinement. That's the best we can do. Um, the rest is wasted to various, you can, you can kind of read them there, but uh, the core beast is the, the internal combustion engine um, is, is at best 25% efficient. So whatever goes into it, 75% is wasted. And then you've got drive trying and you've got idling losses. And, uh, but again, that's, that's pretty unbelievable that something that refined, perhaps the most refined machine on the planet, uh, is still so poor. So I think what started to happen here is, um, you know, we decided not to refine it anymore. We thought, how can we replace it? Because it's re no more refinement really is going to move the needle that much, right? Uh, and again, one thought would be, well, okay, let's, let's make the vehicles smaller. Let's make them lighter, lighter in weight. But again, in, in goods delivery, there's a certain economy that you just have to have, you know, so many deliveries uh, per day to make it economical. And uh, I've just got a quick, clickers don't work, a quick uh, graph here, and it's kind of intuitive. Uh, if you're not delivering a lot, if you're just delivering 20 things a day, it's going to cost you a lot, right? So the vehicles really can't get any smaller, per se, and uh, you're kind of stuck at, at 14%. So we, um, we made an electric truck. Um, I think that's the next slide here. So this is our electric chassis. This is actually the hybrid chassis. Uh, this is the one UPS bought 125 of these. Uh, as Carlton said, but really, I, I want to take a minute. 125, as far as we know, is the largest one-time purchase of electric medium-duty trucks. So that was quite a courageous thing for them to do, and we're all trying to get scale, so it helps when, when the fleet leaders will take a chance and, 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 and start to, to, to move the needle. Now, they did that after testing them quite a bit, and we found that it gives a 400% increase in fuel economy. Again, 400% on a needle that's very, very mature, right? 
Uh, that's, that's quite dramatic. And we also found that the, the maintenance is dramatically reduced. And we also found, this is just our internal uh, work, but we feel that given the reduced maintenance and that typically folks keep these type of vehicles 15, 20 years, just on a reduced maintenance, even if gasoline went to zero, we think we could cost justify these vehicles. So uh, it's not just fuel economy, it's not just emissions, it's, um, it's maintenance as well. Because the stop and go nature of a delivery vehicle, which is what you have to have when you're delivering goods, uh, it's, it's where an internal combustion and an automatic transmission operate in their worst range. Least efficient, you just grind them up. So this vehicle doesn't have a transmission, for example, just a direct drive. So just imagine um, taking a transmission out of the loop. No more maintenance, no more robbing 20% of your energy. That's just kind of one benefit. Uh, and, um, let's go to the next one here. Just a little quick CAD drawing for any engineers in here. The complexity of this, they're fairly complex and yet they're really relatively simple. And the only wear item is the batteries. In our case, uh, we use the same cells as Tesla uses, so we get good long life and predictability and cost out of those batteries. But uh, essentially, you have a very large motor there going straight into the, into the drive shaft. Up front here, we have an, as an option, we have a range extender. And this is just a gasoline, a small sub-liter gasoline engine uh, that's there for basically insurance policy. Let's say it's Christmas, it's long, longer days, uh, let's say it's very, very cold out, or it's very, very hilly terrain, or whatever it is, um, so that range anxiety is gone. You should run on electric all day and get that 400% increase in economies. Um, but in case something happens, the show will always go on and uh, you'll burn a little gasoline and charge the batteries a little bit. Okay, so I think next we look at the driver. So that's kind of the horse. So we, we really feel we've made a new horse, right? Um, but the driver is a big part of the equation. So a lot of firms have realized, okay, well, the, the best mile is the one not driven, right? So a lot of drivers and a lot of firms, um, they know their delivery route. You can imagine we've all used Google Maps, but if you put that on steroids, you can calculate the best route to drive for that driver. So really, they've got the driver so buttoned down that hardly any extra miles are driven these days, right? There's just no guesswork in anymore. So if you've... You know, if you've, if you've taken internal combustion as far as you can, and you've taken the driver to, to full automation, you know, what else is there? Where are you gonna get the next giant leap, right? So again, we made a better horse, that's a big leap. And uh, for the driver, what we wanted to do was um, add a drone to the equation. There's certain, there's certain places where the drone can deliver the package more cost effectively, make that driver, we're not trying to replace a driver, we're not talking about automatic autonomous driving, because we feel there's gonna have to be a, a physical human delivering things. But if that human can be augmented, and you have, um, you have three deliveries to the right, very tight, and one, one delivery a mile to the left, why not give the one to the left to the bird? You go ahead and do your three, and it will catch up to you. It will figure out, after it makes its delivery, We'll figure out where you are and fly and redock with the truck. And by the way, it charges its battery whenever it's docked. So, you know, just a lot of stop and go delivery, quick recharging and going, right? So that took a bit of doing. That isn't just a drone that you buy, you get under your Christmas tree. That is a dedicated drone that we had to build and integrate it to the truck. And what you'll see is the redocking of the truck uh, was very, very complicated, especially in the wind. Right? We've got a little video of that we're going to show you. But it, it's pretty cool. Uh, but this is what, what happens is when you take a bird's eye view of things, right? everything that's been done considers, well, I have to drive to that location. What if you, what if you started to look at things at a different kind of perspective? Right? And this is a little complicated, but essentially it's showing you that I wouldn't have to drive that red route if I could just give the package to the bird and it could fly as a, as a crow flies. And, and get that job done, okay? So it, it just, it's just a new perspective and it, it suddenly uh, gets very, very attractive economically. So of course, these are all electric drones. 
no pollution. Zero pollution, virtually no maintenance. Right? Um, uh, kind of conventional wisdom is a diesel truck is about a dollar a mile to operate all in, maintenance and fuel. Uh, our electric truck is a fourth of that. Pretty good. But just to put it in perspective, uh, the Horsefly, which is the name of our delivery drone, uh, it uses about three cents a mile of electricity when it flies. And again, no driver time. So it, it's pretty compelling uh, economically and emission-wise. Uh, this is a look at it. Now, I should say, I'm just about to show a little video. It's just a minute long. But currently in the United States, uh, the FAA does not permit commercial use of drones. Right? They've, they're working on the, re the regulatory part of it. It's very hard for them. Technology is moving so quickly that regulatory is having a hard time keeping up. But they are, in all likelihood, going to come out with a, a law this year, towards the end of the year, to allow commercial use of drones. In the meantime, they've allowed a few companies exemptions to start using them now under very restrictive criteria so that the FAA can get some learnings. And um, we got one of the few exemptions to start testing delivery drones. Most drone use is uh, some sort of camera, video app, or photo app. Uh, but delivery has to come down into Peopleville. So it's a whole new set of criteria. And then our extra burden of launching and landing from a truck uh, was something the FAA you know, obviously had never seen. So um, we have been testing. They gave us the exemption about three months ago. And we've been testing making deliveries to homes, just our, our own boxes, our own different weights. We can carry up to 10 pounds uh, of package. It's pretty covers a lot of packages. OK, I think the next slide is going to play the video. Good. So that was a, a real delivery, not a real, real delivery, but that was an actual, completely automated delivery. I, want you to, I don't know if you noticed or not, but we do have um, somebody watching it while it's descending in the last 200 feet towards the spot. And, and it also, if you notice, an address isn't enough, right? Just a street address isn't enough. But the familiarity a driver will have with a, with a home or a work, and the driver picked on the screen, on the dashboard of the truck, this is for this particular house, this is where they like to deliver you. So we take that kind of tribal knowledge that doesn't exist in any database, and we start to turn it into an automated system. At any rate, um, but as it's descending, you know, for the foreseeable future, we're having somebody watch it. It has cameras on it. And somebody, it's completely automated, but somebody with a joystick will watch it in case there's a, a bush, a dog, uh, something that we need to, uh, to move. So uh, one pilot. You know, it's kind of like a call, command center, a call center, where they just are constantly landing, constantly landing. So just to give an extra level of, of uh, safety, and it's kind of like autonomous driving. Until we, all the sensors are proved out, uh, you know, we just want to watch it. So a little bit of a hybrid approach there. Now, just a, another technical thing. I don't know if you, when, when it landed, OK, in the wind, and I've got a very small portal I've got to land into. This is just a quick technical of of what you saw there, 
If it misses, we have a mechanism that picks it up, moves it over, puts it in the hole, and closes the lid. Okay? And uh, I just got a few slides here. I think it's kind of cool. So it was supposed to go in that green hole. It missed. The sensors detect how much it missed. The bars come in, completely automatic. Get up underneath it, lift it up, move it into the hole, come down. And then the door closes. Anyway, it, it, um, it, was, um, it took a lot of technology, but it's pretty cool. Uh, the thing can fly 50 miles per hour. It can carry, like I said, 10 pounds. Its empty weight is 15 pounds. That's a pretty good ratio that a 15 pound uh, system can carry almost its, its total weight. It has eight, eight rotors on it. That's designed up to two can fail and it can still land safely. Might not be able to fly anymore. The odds of two failing are almost non-existent, maybe except for a bird strike or something like that. Um, so a lot of redundancy. To re we put a lot of work into it to make sure this cannot come out of the sky. In the end, we think we're going to be able to prove that it's actually safer than a diesel truck coming down your road and a, a driver coming out. That'll take some while to, to prove, but if, even if it's not safer, it's still going to be more economic for certain deliveries. So it's just an augmenter, uh, again, going back to the Pony Express, where...